Welcome to the Swiss Re Institute and Asia Society Switzerland webinar that asks the question, how long can we live? Part of the Aging Effect series in which we are exploring the impact of demographic and technological change on Asia and the world. The secrets of longevity and healthy aging are being targeted by genetic and dietary manipulation, lifestyle change, and even by drugs. Where does the optimal balance lie? My name is Richard Francis, and I will be moderating the discussion between our experts, Professor Nia Barzilai, Director for the Institute of Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, who recently published the book, Age Later. And Dr. John Scoonby, Global Chief Medical Officer at Swiss Re, who coordinates an international team of medicos covering key global health topics. Welcome, Nia and John. Let's get the discussion moving while we wait for our audience to send in questions using the Q&A. Nia, can you get us started by presenting the key issues you are grappling with at the Institute for Aging Research? Uh, sure, and thank you very much. And it's an absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, and I'll make some provocations, but I wanna make just one thing really clear. Um, aging has a biology. You see that, you know who's old and who's young. What are teachers and fathers and mothers have failed to realize is that aging is flexible. Aging can be targeted. Aging can be delayed. Aging can be stopped and reversed in certain instances. And, and we are exactly at the stage where we did go from hope to promise, but how to realize the promise now is the question. Um, the, the way to intervene with aging are environmental, you know, lifestyle, and there are drugs also. And that's where we'll get uh, soon, but I'll start with several things so that you realize something, some important things about the biology. And the first thing is the relationship between death uh, and age from variety of diseases. So let me just take an example. Um, your chances of, of dying from heart uh, attack when you go from heart disease, when you go from in your 20s to in your 80s is a thousand fold, right? It's going, it's going from five to 5,000. So you'll say, hey, just a minute, cholesterol is the major risk, but no, aging is the major risk by a lot. Uh, and you see how parallel it is for cancer. It's the same story. What's important for you guys that see and hope to see lots of curves going on is the fact that they're logarithmic. The risk for aging for any one of, this, of those diseases is incredible. It includes for pneumonia, which is kind of the cause of, of death for COVID, which I'll mention uh, soon. And, and that means to us one thing, that aging drives the diseases. Aging is the common mechanism for the diseases. So the only way to make a progress and not to accumulate disease after disease is to stop the aging. Because look, if you have a heart attack and you go to the hospital and you get the bypass or a stent, this was a local treatment to your heart. What really happened to those people who survived? Will they get uh, diabetes or cancer or, or, uh, or pneumonia uh, uh, or Alzheimer? And, and that's what they do. We need to stop the aging process because that's what drives the disease. Uh, and what we're trying to do now, actually, outside in clinical, with regulatory, with, with FDA, with, st with clinical studies, is to flatten this. So we are trying to really delay aging significantly. And just a word about, uh, about the corona, and this is data from China and Italy and the United States and, and, the, and the EU, and it all says the same thing. Your chances of death after the age of 80 is about 200 fold more than when you're in your 20s. Uh, there's terrible ageism. <laughs> this virus has no eyes, but it can see through our eyes maybe and through the fact that we haven't been there 
uh, enough prepared, they see who's old and they're killing the old people. And, and this would be nothing if there's, uh, uh, unless there's something to do about it. So let me make some comments about what we can do about it. Um, the biology of aging, the, there's a whole uh, science, it's called geroscience. I'm a geroscientist. And we agreed on several hallmarks of aging. How do you become a hallmark of aging? If you target any one of those hallmarks and in preclinical data or in humans, they are healthier and they live longer, well, that's a hallmark. And I'm not going to take you through all those hallmarks, but make just several observation. The decline in immune function and inflammation are very key at what happens in COVID. But not only that, if you treat any one of those, you have effect on the others. In other words, in order to make progress about aging, you don't have to be effective in all of them. You can target few of them and get pretty far away. The problem with COVID is that we need to increase the immunity and decrease the inflammation, which is what kills those people. But the reason we have to target aging is because the, we need to increase the ability of the body to be more resilient to a very severe disease. It, Unfortunately, and this is, by the way, this is protecting, uh, fortifying the host. This is nothing to do with, with virus. This has to do with flu, with this virus, and with, next, with the next virus. We, had, we have to increase the immunity and we have to increase the resilience of the body. And even more important than that, let me just state it clearly. Most of the ways that vaccines are being developed now are not going to be effective in the elderly. If they're not going to be effective in the elderly, you're not going to make such a progress with death. So the, the biology of aging is very important to consider apropos virus. Now, one of the studies that I've been doing is uh, this one and, 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 and Khan family is, uh, is kind of the poster child. Those are four kids that were born between 1910 and 1920 in New York to the same parents. And Basically, they all live to be over the age of 102, 102, 105, 107, 109. What, what are the chances that uh, people live that long? And let me just tell you that I met Helen when she was 100, 100 years old and she opened the door and she was smoking. And I said, Helen, nobody ever told you in 100 years not to smoke? And she said, yeah. The four doctors that told me to stop smoke, they died. But the point here is, yeah, it's true that if you smoke 90 years, you live long life, but uh, centenarians are very special. They are very resilient. I'm following all the, the centenarians that got COVID and survived uh, COVID-19. And so they have a genetic secret for longevity, which we uncovered in part, and we are uh, covering more. We have 750 centenarians and their family. But really the most important thing I, I want to impress you is that we are looking here at whether they get diseases uh, when everybody gets diseases and then they are sick for a very long time or are they healthy? And here you see our controls that are healthy. Th this is all about health. They're healthy and then somewhere when they're 60, they're starting to get sick and only 10% of them at 80 are not sick. While our centenarians live 20, 30 years longer without disease and even after the age of 100, 30% are not, are not sick. So this is one thing, but a more important thing is they have contraction of morbidity. They live, 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 and then they die. And this is very important. If we can achieve health span, and contract morbidity, there's a longevity, what we call a longevity dividend. And even the CDC showed that the medical cost over the age of 100 is the, la the last two years of life are about third of if you die when you're 60 to 70 years old. I wanna mention something about the drug. There is a drug that if you give to any animal in the world, they live longer. <laughs> and 
in humans, it's called metformin. It's, it's a drug that's, that was initially given for, to prevent flu and malaria. And now, uh, and then it was found to have anti-diabetic effects. So it's a major drug for diabetes. But everybody with diabetes on this drug has less cancer, less Alzheimer, less cardiovascular disease, less, less mortality. People on metformin with diabetes live longer than people without diabetes. And I'm just showing you here uh, five studies that summarize, and there are eight studies around the world, but those are summarizing eight studies, uh, five studies that show that people who were on metformin and got infected with COVID, they had less hospitalization and less mortality. So this is just an example of one drug that, that it has to be repurposed, and that's what we're trying to do, it repurpose, it increase immunity, increase inflammation, and, and prevents hospitalization and, and mortality. And, and I think COVID-19 is an opportunity for us to, uh, to make it faster here. So I'm, I'm ending here just with one note. There's much more than we can do about aging. If you take even a sperm of a 70 year old and a 50 year old woman and fertilize them, when the blastocytes form, it erases aging, okay? Uh, we all start at zero. We don't have a recognition of what happens on the DNA or on the epigenetics of our, our parents. So we figured out how to do it in this example. We're figuring out how to erase aging for the rest of our body. And, and I'll stop here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Nia. Uh, we'll talk a bit more later on that. Uh, but now, John, uh, over to you. Research on aging and mortality are, are of fundamental interest to the, the insurance industry. Uh, what's your position as Global Chief Medical Officer at Swiss Re? Thanks, Richard. Uh, and thanks, Nia. That was super interesting. Um, this idea of, of uh, living longer, of course, is, is something that uh, insurers and reinsurers particularly are, are very interested in. And uh, I think the focus today, if, if you have a look at this, this is survival curves over uh, a number of years. And of course, we've improved survival because we've you know, learned to wash our hands and, and done clever things. Uh, and then, of course, we developed antibiotics. Um, and the question kind of is, can we almost create more of a rectangle, right? Can we move more into the right-hand top corner? What I think we're not really focusing on today is the, the bottom arrow in terms of, you know, can we extend life to 150 or 200? That, I think that's a, a whole different ball game. It um, involves uh, a lot of speculation and um, I don't think Neil and I are really gonna focus on that. And I think the, the lowest hanging fruit uh, to focus on really um, certainly for the industry and for, for people as a whole, is, is the green arrow. Um, unfortunately, um, with all our advances, um, we've changed our lifestyle a whole lot. And uh, this is just one of hundreds of, of graphs I, uh, I could find on um, the epidemic of obesity. All right, so this is a percentage of overweight in different countries. Um, it's happening everywhere, and aligned to this, of course, is the increase in diabetes. Uh, and what does this mean? So what this means is that uh, we get uh, studies that are done by uh, actuarial societies. In this case, it's in the UK, where uh, they do um, these continuous um, investigations, mortality investigations, and uh, certainly the industry for life uh, cover uses something called uh, mortality improvements, where there's an assumption built into the price that people are going to improve uh, their mortality, live longer. Uh, and what you can see is that the experience shows that there has been a slowdown. And the slowdown, uh, of course, there's lots of speculation as to why the slowdown is occurring, but um, certainly it's not unreasonable to assume that the obesity and diabetic epidemic um, is, is part of it. So how does the industry assess somebody's risk or somebody's health. So we use what clinicians typically use. So for somebody who's vaguely healthy and applies for insurance, we look at cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and really it's, it's bold, so body mass index, blood pressure, cholesterol ratios, and things like gluc glucose metabolism. And we, Framingham risk scores been around forever. Um, 
it's it's well validated. The QRISC-3 is very well validated risk score. And what I've done is I've just put in some values here and this 50 year old male now has a 20% chance of getting an event in 10 years as opposed to if he was healthy to be 3.8% chance. And the big question is what is driving these risk factors? So these clinical risk factors, are they, we, we call them risk factors, but in a way they're really markers and they're markers of our lifestyle. And lifestyle factors can really be considered the makers of cardiovascular risk. Um, and typically they get lip service uh, because they're very hard to, to change. So somebody's told, you know what, you need to lose weight, you need to exercise more, you need to stop smoking, like um, the, 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 the Khan lady that uh, spoke to Nia. But, but typically people don't listen. And so what happens then is we use pharmaceuticals, right? Um, and we give people medications to try and control those cardiovascular risks. Um, and we have done a huge amount of uh, research and investigation into these lifestyle factors. We're calling them the big six. So we're looking at obviously physical activity, sleep, nutrition, substance use, mental well-being, the environment. And we are looking to see how we can combine these with the clinical risk factors. And this is an example just of something simple like sleep. Um, and it just shows how sleep can affect all those cardiovascular risks that the risk calculators use. So you can see there's BMI, there's blood pressure, there's cholesterol, there's um, diabetes risk. So all these things can be affected by something as simple as um, impaired or, or dysfunctional sleep. Um, and the question really is, is how much should we push the lifestyle, I guess, and, and how much should we push um, new medications like metformin? Thank you very much, John. Look, that last uh, line sort of sums up a little bit where we're heading today. Is it genetics, drugs uh, versus lifestyle? Is it all together? But uh, one question you were tiptoeing around, and that is, you know, how long can we live? I mean, could we live forever? Uh, what, what science and, and, and what science fiction? You first, John, and then we'll throw it over to, to Nia for his prognosis, let's say, yeah? So, so I really like, I like the idea of, of health span. So I, I think that we, we have a natural limit. Um, I, I know that the super ages that Nia works with, you know, are, are living north of 100, 115. Um, I, I think there's clear genetic advantage in some people. And if you're not going to do genetic engineering on people, uh, I, I think um, the mid 90s, uh, to 100 are probably where the average people could live if they really control their lifestyle well. Um, but then, of course, there are some of those with, with significant genetic advantages. I think the idea of living to 150 or 200 without um, kind of almost science fiction um, interventions, uh, I don't think that's really possible. Over to you, Neil. What do you think? So I, 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 I agree with it. I, I'm totally agree. Look, we geroscientists think that the maximal lifespan of human as a species is about 115. And I should just say, that doesn't mean that it has to stay, but for now, okay? But, but the other side is we die before the age of 80. So there are 35 years that we have to realize. Now, one thing I would just argue and give examples it's not, yeah, we find longevity genes in centenarians, but two of them have been also already target for medicine. What we're doing is discovering of the pathway. The treatment is not genetic treatment in the majority of the cases. So there's, there's two examples that Merck and Ionis have developed drug based on findings uh, uh, that we had. And so it's really concentrating for now on our ability to have health span during this time. But I want to make another point that's related to John's uh, presentation. Part of the reason that we have deceleration is because there is a roof. The demographer usually said, oh, in the last 100 years, we always live longer and longer, but there is a roof. It's 115, maybe it's less, maybe it's more, but it's a roof. So you can start seeing the effect of the roof and we have to concentrate how to use, to use the health spin now. Uh, and, and, and not change so significantly in longevity. So, you know, 
the, these are some of the barriers, but it sounds like uh, there's something, you know, you're saying metformin, it sounds like a pretty cheap solution. Uh, why isn't everyone just out there jumping on the metaforin bandwagon, the metformin bandwagon and, 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 and taking that up? I mean, you know, if you can take some drugs and live to 115, it sounds pretty good to me, Nick. Yeah? Well, the, the reason is that around the world, aging is not recognized as a, as a disease or as a targeted um, indication, right? And, and this is the challenge because we geroscientists don't want to call aging disease. You know, not everybody is sick when they are old. Um, the ARP, the Retirement Organization, doesn't want to call aging release. The, the Gerontological Society of America doesn't. American Federation of Aging Research, the FDA, they all don't want to call uh, aging a disease. So we are using it forming as a tool to repurpose it to prevent a cluster of age-related disease. They can call it what they want, but we know what it is and what it's doing. And this is our approach and effort. John, is this something that insurance companies should be interested in? I mean, you, know, you take some drugs and then, you know, morbidity drops and, and you know, there's that longevity dividend, or is it a dividend for insurance companies as well? Oh, there is no doubt about that. Um, so, you know, if, if you think of that survival curve and if you shift people towards the top right, um, and, and you think of the, the, the graph that Nir showed with, with um, all the diseases as, as aging progresses. You know, when people get diseases, of course, they, they are um, the, their medical costs, right, that, that you incur from a, a health insurance point of view. Um, you then start getting uh, diseases that you may be insured for, like cancer or uh, heart attacks, which are covered with critical illness. Eventually, you need additional care, so long-term care products kick in. Um, and then, of course, uh, these diseases are going to lead to an, an earlier um, uh, death. So, so life insurance ends up paying out. And so by getting this longevity dividend, you, you're reducing the costs um, and certainly delaying the costs of all those insurance layers. And what that means is it's of course, it's a benefit for the protection industry, but it's a benefit for the consumers because the second the, the claims reduce, it means premiums reduce. So people end up paying less for cover, and it means we extend the cover. More people can afford that. And the whole idea of you know, Swiss Re's vision is really to make the world more resilient. And so it fits firmly in our vision to to reduce the protection gap and, and uh, allow more people to have cover if we can somehow reduce these claims. And we've done quite a lot of work, Swiss Re Institute, um, in the nutrition space. So with the British Medical Journal, um, we've had two very large conferences on trying to get to the bottom of, of nutritional science because we believe that nutrition is, is kind of a really key driver um, and, you know, if you think of metformin and the, and the fact that um, it's not the only impact that it has, but it improves insulin sensitivity and um, insulin is a really big driver of disease and the whole metabolic dysfunction that people get with prediabetes and diabetes um, really tends to drive almost all those clinical risk factors. So I, I, I think there's a huge overlap between certainly nutrition and, and metformin. And we know that nutrition can um, put a lot of people with type 2 diabetes into remission um, with certain nutritional patterns. Um, and of course, we know that, that metformin is really useful um, for diabetics too. That's, you know, it, it's the majority of its use globally. So um, I think we'd be really, really interested in this. Uh, it's, it's always tricky when um, you give a medication to an ostensibly healthy, albeit now healthy person, um, because, you know, this is something that is, that is, I suppose, foreign, it's not natural, it has side effects. Um, but, you know, uh, as Nia has written about, I've, I've watched some of his um, uh, presentations he's given, uh, you know, it's been around for decades, and it has a really good safety profile. So it certainly would be a reasonable candidate, I guess, to, to be looking at. Uh, look, it, we're, we're doing uh, 
a series which has a relationship to, to Asia. That's part of our focus. You know, with over half the world's population crammed in one continent, that's a serious environmental uh, uh, consideration here. You know, how is the, the balance going to be, you know, if you can just prescribe some drugs out there, uh, you know, in, in Asia, is that a, a great thing? Nia, I'm going to throw it back to you because you were a visiting professor in Singapore and also an advisor uh, on ageing to the Prime Minister there. You know, what did you conclude out there? Uh, for, first of all, the urgency in the Far East is far greater than anywhere else. Japan, obviously, but China, look, they're, they're paying for not having enough kids to sustain the elderly. Uh, so it's a huge problem. What I liked with Singapore, that is such a, a forward-looking country, when they asked me to come and advise, I said, can you send me some questions so I can prepare better? And one of the questions, should we put metformin in the water? Okay, now the answer is no, <laughs> okay? But, but you have to ask those questions and you have to plan for how you implement things. And, and I think that some places in Asia, because it's more urgent, because we are looking forward in a better way, they might be there uh, even before uh, the West. Uh, John, over to you, because I know uh, Swiss Re in Asia has been promoting uh, the idea of a, a hundred year life and, and products around it. You know, how realistic is all this for Asia? I think it's really realistic. And, um, you know, one of the, the scary things, uh, apart from the demographic shift and the demographic challenge that they face with, with fewer young people to help look after the elderly, is um, that this metabolic um, wave, everyone seems to think it's, you know, it's, it's Western countries, it's, it's the US, it's the UK, Canada have all seen slowdowns in mortality improvements. But um, the diabetes and pre-diabetes prevalence in China is frighteningly high and different studies give sometimes conflicting results but um, it's as high in in certain urban areas as it is in in western countries which is going to cause a huge burden of of disease um, for them so i think it's it's as important there absolutely as it is um, uh, in the rest of the world but I, i'd like to ask near something if i may um if you had if somebody had to ask you um you know, you're not going to get a lot of Mrs. Khans in the world. Some, some average person who's, say, 50, vaguely healthy and says, um, should I take metformin um, or should I try and improve my lifestyle? Should I eat properly, do some exercise? Um, which is more important? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. So first of all, there is no drug that they are approved for this purpose, right? Let's start with that. So the answer is exercise and nutrition are the most important thing for now. If you want to get below, be, be beyond age 80, those are the opportunities now. But I, want to, uh, but I want to make several points around it. You know, people who survive cancer, they age later. If they got chemotherapy or radiation, they age very, very fast, okay? They need help. People, People who are in a wheelchair, they also need help because they don't move and they eat and they cannot exercise, right? HIV, people with HIV have age-related disease 10 years before other people. And poor people, you could argue, poor people that cannot exercise and stuff. Metformin is actually the cheapest uh, drug almost in the world, <laughs> you know, maybe you can achieve something with metformin because they're not going to, uh, uh, to exercise or diet reasonably. And lastly, if we want to go to Mars, okay, we need some drug because if not, we'll have cancer or we'll die from coronary on the way there. We'll never make it back. So we have, there's many reasons and many constituents that we have to uh, have in our fight for aging. Look, we're, we're starting to get lots of very good questions coming in from the audience. So I'm going to start throwing over there. A quick one while I assemble some of these for, for you, Nia. Uh, the, the question, you mentioned pregnancy and ageing. Uh, can you elaborate for our, 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 our audience? They're interested in what that means. I, I saw that and I, I just don't know. I must have mispronounced a word, but no, I didn't say okay. anything about 
Okay, then we've got something else. A, a quick question for you, Nir. Obviously, uh, someone's asking when's the best time for healthy people to start pay, taking metformin, you know, to, to achieve healthy aging. So you, you understand that I'm not selling metformin. We need to do this study. We need to really use it and get the indication and not ruin it for everyone. And the study is with people between the age of 65 and 80. Not because metformin is not uh, relevant before, but because we need to show lots of outcomes on many diseases. So we will not know what's the best time. But I'll tell you that, for example, for prevention of diabetes that John mentioned, the study started at age 50, and, and within four years, there was 30% prevention of diabetes, which means that it does something at, at age 50. Um, uh, so, so we will figure it out, but I, I cannot say when now. Um, I'm gonna have to throw another one at you, Nir. Uh, uh, questions come in that ask, what does it mean from a clinical perspective that aging slows down? So, so look, what, what the FDA wants now is hard outcomes, okay? So it's heart disease, it's cancer, it's Alzheimer and it's mortality. When we said diabetes also, we said, no, we're not interested in diabetes. Why they're not interested in diabetes? Because people get complication of diabetes 10 years later or only 40% of that get complication 10 years later. That's not like a hard outcome. So from a regulatory, a regulatory perspective, we are talking about outcomes of major age-related disease, a cluster of them. Uh, but of course, we're interested in other things, like does it change hair and skin, right? And, and acute daily living and, and many other things, and we'll figure it out. So I, I just want to uh, talk separately about other aging phenotype and the one that we need in a study like that. Look, I'm, I'm going to throw over a question to, to John that came in from the audience. You know, uh, with people living longer, are we into some sort of Malthusian nightmare? What, what's the social impact uh, that we have here, John? And, and how will insurance products need to, uh, to change in order to cope with, with all these people living longer? Um, I, I don't think, you know, without the genetic advantage, if, if you're taking the average life expectancy um, in the in the high 70s, uh, low 80s for for most countries. If let's assume people started taking metformin, right? You'd slowly start reducing the disease uh, impact, um, and and people will will live a little longer. And of course, um, as people live a little longer, it means that overall you're going to have a slightly increased number of people alive at the same time, I guess. Um, but of course, the care burden and the care costs will in theory reduce. So I, I think it's quite hard to to know what that impact's going to be. I, I think if if you know if there was some kind of dystopian switch where we can suddenly get everybody to live to live to be two hundred, it could be pretty disastrous. You're gonna have three times the number of people on earth, right? So so that 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 that's again not something we're really talking about now. Um in terms of insurance, uh, you know, I, th I think the elderly um, are always difficult to insure because the, the risks of disease, as Nia has showed, are extremely high, which means the cost of insurance is extremely high. Um, and so if we had a way to reduce the incidence of those events, of the diseases, of the diagnoses, of the, the care need, then it suddenly becomes um, a lot more affordable. And so I think it can be a focus for us to, and, and it's been a focus certainly for Swiss Re for some time now is to, um, you know, somehow um, offer more to this changing demographic, but it's really hard because of the, the cost implications. I mean, long-term care as an example was around in the US um, and, you know, completely, it was a disaster in terms of the, the costs that were incurred there. Um, in Europe, we still have quite a bit of long-term care, um, but I think we can expand that offering to the population, yeah. Look, I'll throw it across the near. Uh, you know, uh, what about living this long, what's gonna be the impact on our human cultural evolution? How, how will we, our cultures change? Right, so, so social uh, scientists, geoscientists are talking about it. and. 
and I'll, I'll just frame it like that. We have um, to translate the usefulness to usefulness, okay? How are the elderly going to be useful to this society? And I, I don't wanna expand here, but there's a lot of ways and lots of examples around the world of what elderly retired people are doing, whether teaching in classes or uh, being in kindergartens and, and, uh, and, and finding other jobs, second career and, and other things. So it's about usefulness. I, I wanna say that in, uh, in Davos this year, somebody said, why, why do we need people over this age of 65? Let, let's, just, let's just kill everyone of 65. Didn't mean it really. But the point is, if you kill everybody over the age of 65, the economy of the world will collapse because it's 40% of the economy. The older people have more resources. They buy more. They buy more to their kids. They go and travel more. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have uh, to use this health span and translate it to economy. E even in the medical space, there'll be less diseases, but you need more technology. You want better hearing aids and, 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 and other technology that can help. So I, I think it's going to happen all in parallel. And, and I think on the academic level, we're prepared for the challenge. I'm um, Richard. Sorry. Go for it, John. Richard, yeah. could, 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 could I jump in and ask Nair something? He's, he's done a lot of research, um, I think, on the blue zones and, and the people that, that are living um, longer. Uh, certainly one of the things that gets mentioned is purpose, is the respect that, that the society has for the elderly in these areas and the purpose that these um, older people have in society. How is that going to work in in cultures where um, that doesn't exist so strongly and, and elderly are, are, you know, put in care situations rather than remaining part of society? I, I, I really, I'm not this expert on this field. I think it's a good question. If somebody can help us, it's, it's really interesting. I, I don't know how it's going to work across the world. And I totally agree that you need uh, local uh, solutions to many of those problems. I'm going to quickly step in here because obviously we can improve our cellular, you know, functioning, metabolic functioning, everything. But but what about things like dementia? It's not just physical deterioration. You know, do we really reinforcing? People are asking out there in the audience, you know, how much is it really about you know lifestyle and mental um, uh, positiveness? You could say to to achieve 115 health span there. Well, ju just to note that. Uh, for us, uh, it's also an aging problem in the brain, the Alzheimer's disease. Look, even if you have a strong genetic to Alzheimer's and you're a woman and some women get Alzheimer's when they're 60 years old, okay? But it did take them 60 years old to get the Alzheimer, right? They needed the biology for aging for that. If we can change the biology of aging in every cell in our body, it will affect a cognitive decline. And there are several studies, even control studies, that suggest that uh, people with MCI on metformin retain much more memory than, than, than other people. So my, my answer is you have to do, and it was my answer for the COVID, it's not only about immunity. You have to improve, uh, you have to improve the whole body when you target aging uh, and prevent all those diseases at the same time. Well, on, on that note, that's all the, the time we have for questions. Uh, we've still got questions coming in from our audience, so I'm sorry we couldn't ask all of them. Uh, there was, um, I'm gonna ask for a final wrap up from our experts in the last five minutes. Um, I'm sure our audience is curious as to what you're doing yourself because you know, the questions have been coming in about what are your top things to, to do to, uh, to age healthily. Uh, John, you first, are, are you walking the talk? What, do you, what are your top uh, pieces of advice here? In a nutshell, what I try and do is keep my insulin levels low. Um, and keeping insulin levels low, I, I believe, reduces inflammation. It, it means that, um, you know, by fasting, you allow yourself to be in a ketogenic state sometimes. Our brain cells, as they age, um, you know, related to the dementia. Um, studies have been done finding that um, 
brain cells sometimes stop lose the ability to use glucose efficiently and if their ketones are bound, they potentially could survive longer. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why fasting is beneficial apart from, from all the other biological benefits that we can have with that. So keeping insulin levels low, which means doing a bit of exercise, avoiding sugar, fasting, um, and getting out in, into nature, as you can see from my background. Is, is that for real, John, the background there? Or is it uh, you know, one of the yep, studios? That's a, so you walk the track there, yeah? No, that's a, that's a cycling path on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, fair enough. Nia, over to you. Uh, in your, you know, I'm not sure you've got a garden. Perhaps it's that. But... Uh, yeah, so, so first of all, I exercise a lot every day. I exercise all the time. And I'm also on metformin. And by the way, I had COVID and it was very mild. I was two days, a little bit sick. I still worked and I'm... Um, I've, I've been over it in two days. I, I didn't exercise for two days. So I think it's that. But let me give the audience something really important. You know, uh, in our lab, we put uh, mice or rats uh, to test if they live healthier and longer. We give them drugs or genetic manipulation. And our control is caloric restricted animals. When you caloric restrict mice or rats or actually any animal in the world, they would live healthier and longer, much longer. So this is our control. And, what, and, and this was taken to say that if you eat less breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then you live longer. But guess what? We are giving them the food in the morning and they're hungry and they're eating all the food for the day in 20 minutes. And then they're fasting for 23 hours more. If we give them actually the same amount of food throughout the day, yes, they're leaner, but they don't live longer. So the fasting is important through decreasing insulin, through ketones, like John mentioned. But what I'm, and so what I'm doing, I'm fasting for 16 hours. For example, it's, it's going to be noontime now. I'm already 16 hours. I'm probably not going to eat for another hour, at least 16 hours, and then I can have whatever I want. What you find out is that a lot of people, in particular men, lose a lot of weight and maintain this weight. They, they feel better. But most important, it's easy to do. Because if you would give me diet for three months, I could, I could give up any day. Uh, but if I have only one hour or two hours to go, I'm not going to break, to break on that. So just, just for you to think how also we translate science into clinical things, there's no really evidence that it's going to work in humans, but it's suggestive and it's not dangerous. So, so Nia, are you, are you playing by the book uh, to age later? Is this all in there, the fasting and, and your advice? Uh, right. I'm, I'm talking about many things just to show people that this is not a snake oil. We have a lot of research over many years to discover what are the most important thing and how do we proceed. So if you're interested in parts, you can see parts. If you want to see what our centenarians are saying, you can see, you can see that. But we can age later. And, uh, and, uh, and I think John is doing it. Richard, for a 40-year-old guy, you look really old, but, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But we can do something about it. <laughs> Uh, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm very flattered being 75, but anyway, uh, well, well, there we have it. Some secrets for healthy aging, uh, some common sense and some common drugs may help you to live uh, healthily until 115 years of age. So thank you very much to our experts, Professor Nia Basilai, Director for the Institute of Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and Dr. John Scoonby, Global Chief Medical Officer at Swiss Re. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure. Thank you Any so much. Thank you. Bye, Richard. Pleasure. Thanks, Nia. Yeah.